I'm going to be discussing viral hepatitis in pregnancy, which is quite a vast topic. And I'm going to be looking at hepatitis A, B, C, and E, and really trying to relate this to, to Africa. So my disclosure slide, I've received a grant for setting up the viral hepatitis in sub-Saharan ECHO program. So if we look at viral hepatitis in pregnancy, it's important that we consider the type of viral hepatitis. Is it acute or chronic? As this poses different risks to the pregnant woman, but also to the fetus and the newborn um, child. And the risks of vertical transmission are potentially higher with acute viral hepatitis. It's important to know what the impact of the viral hepatitis is on pregnancy outcomes. What is the risk of vertical transmission? Is this intrauterine, intrapartum, or at postnatally? And importantly, if we look at the top three differential diagnoses, obviously liver diseases of pregnancy, such as preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, and acute fatty liver of pregnancy. But always remember drugs and toxins, and particularly in young women, autoimmune hepatitis. And acute viral hepatitis is probably the most common cause of jaundice in a pregnant woman. So starting with hepatitis A, as we can see from this map, oops, sorry, in Africa, it's really endemic. So most of it is acquired in childhood and is asymptomatic. But unfortunately, we still have pregnant women presenting with acute hepatitis A, and they've probably acquired this from their young children. So unlike hepatitis E, hepatitis A during pregnancy is usually not associated with serious maternal or fetal outcomes. However, in the second and third trimester, gestational complications can occur, such as an increased risk of placental abruption, premature rupture of membranes, and preterm labor. In terms of vertical transmission during pregnancy or puerperm, this is rare, and this is thought to be due to the IgG antibodies which cross the placenta in the initial stages and then provide protection to the infant after delivery. And unfortunately, rare cases of intrauterine um, infection have been reported, particularly if it's acquired in the first trimester. And this has really significant poor outcomes with fetal ascites, meconium peritonitis, and these infants, if they're born, have have jaundice, um, and even distal ILM perforations have been described, but there's no teratonicity reported. So obviously prevention is key. If we have somebody who's pregnant woman actually traveling to an endemic area, one should consider vaccination. This is entirely safe in pregnancy. It's important to administer the immune globulin if a pregnant woman has been exposed to somebody with hepatitis A. And if the infection is in the third trimester, it's important that immunoglobulin is actually administered to the newborn within 48 hours of delivery. Management is supportive, and there's really no indication for termination. Vinyl, vaginal delivery and breastfeeding are not contraindicated, but need to remember this is infectious, and one should probably isolate the mother and the neonate, and nosocomial spread has been documented in maternity units and neonatal ICUs. So moving on to the big one, hepatitis B. So we look at this map, we see how problematic it is in Africa. In red, it's over 10% seroprevalence. But in that inserted map, you see in under five-year-olds, the really mirrors the prevalence in all ages. So it's really important that we look at maternal to child transmission and early childhood acquisition under the age of five. As we know, the prevalence in sub-Saharan Africa, according to WHO, is about 6.1%. So if we look at the global e antigen prevalence, this probably accounts for 20 to 50% of women with, of the childbearing age. And 50 million new cases are diagnosed year, each year, and most of this is thought to be as a result of mother-to-child transmission. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at pregnant women in Africa. We looked at 145 studies, nearly 260,000 participants. And here the prevalence in pregnant women was 6.8%, and of note, 19% of those were e antigen positive. And as was expected, the prevalence actually varied in pregnant women across the different areas, being highest in Central Africa at 9.7%, followed by Western Africa at 8.3%, and then lowest in Southern Africa at 3.8%, and Northern Africa at 2.8%. As was expected in the systematic review, the, pre the prevalence was higher in rural areas than in urban areas. And then it looked at a metagression analysis, and this showed as was to be expected. If you look at the prevalence, it increased with decreasing gender index, the development index, the male's level of education, decreasing females' expected years of schooling, and increasing with the gender inequality index. 
The prevalence was highest in rural, western, and central Africa regions, and was as related to weaker healthcare systems. We know in these regions that HIV infection controls are problematic. And the prevalence in pregnant women in Africa was really similar to the general population. So screening of pregnant women is really essential. We need to do this in the first trimester. Women who are not immune should actually be vaccinated. The vaccine is entirely safe. And if you have ongoing risk behavior during pregnancy and the surface antigen status is unknown, it's recommended at the time of delivery you check for the surface antigen. Those who are surface antigen positive should be referred for additional testing, counseling, and medical management, looking at e-antigen, DNA levels, and LFTs. And once again, this really reinforces the need for us to be able to have point-of-care testing to assess viral replication. But importantly, this is an important point in time where you can actually break cycles in infection by actually screening partners, siblings, and children. Bearing in mind that most women at this childbearing age are either in the immune control or immune tolerant phase, they themselves are not necessarily candidates for hepatitis B treatment, but we need to remember at this stage what is the risk for mother-to-child transmission, and if they have high viral loads over 200,000, whether the e-antigen positive or e-antigen negative, we should be considering the risk of mother-to-child transmission and how we're going to deal with this. So just briefly looking at acute hepatitis B, this is usually benign, not associated with increased mortality. We we'll need to monitor closely with LFTs, INR, and treat conservatively. The risk of mother-to-child transmission will increase with the gestation, but only 10% in early pregnancy, but increases to 60% in the third trimester, particularly close to delivery. Antivirals are not generally recommended unless there's evidence of acute liver failure, but once again, one needs to assess the need to prevent mother-to-child transmission. In terms of the newborn, there is an increased risk of low birth weight, prematurity, no teratogenicity, and importantly, if the mother remains surface antigen positive or has detectable DNA late in the third trimester or near delivery, the baby must get birth dose vaccine, and if appropriate and if possible, to give the H big. And once again, this is not an indication for termination of the pregnancy. But importantly, what is the impact in the terms of chronic hepatitis B? Chronic hepatitis B doesn't usually affect pregnancy outcomes in the absence of cirrhosis, but we know that acute hepatitis B flares can occur during pregnancy and in up to 20% post-delivery. These flares are thought to be related to immune reconstitution, are more e antigen positive women are more likely to have flares, and maybe this may be associated with spontaneous e antigen clearance in nearly 17%. And the e antigen seroconversion is not related to age, parity, or the presence of mutations. DNA levels may increase, but usually actually remain stable during, uh, um, during pregnancy. So we know that women can become pregnant with compensated cirrhosis, and unfortunately, the immunologic, metabolic, and hemodynamic changes may unmask cirrhosis. But once you have cirrhosis and portal hypertension, there's a significant increased risk of decompensation, variceal bleeds, and death, particularly from the second trimester onwards. And the decompensation has, risk has increased if your MALT score is greater than or equal to 10, and this has been shown to have a, almost 83% sensitivity and specificity to predict the risk of decompensation prior to conception. So one needs to screen for varices in these women in the second, from the second trimester onwards. The risk of a variceal bleed is up to 25%. One needs to band as necessary and consider the use of beta blockers, bearing in mind that they do have a risk of imparting, impairing interuterine growth. In terms of the impact of chronic hepatitis B on pregnancy, obviously these women are less likely to become pregnant as a result of anovulation, amenorrhea, infertility. But if they do become pregnant, there are increased maternal complications such as uh, proteinuric hypertension, placental abrupture, peripartum hemorrhage, premature labor, and spontaneous abortion. And infants are more likely to have interuterine growth restriction, prematurity, and stillbirths at a rate of about 5.2%. So what about treatment in pregnancy? Well, if you, the treatment guidelines and indications remain the same. If you're E-antigen positive, E-antigen negative, active disease and hepatitis, you require treatment. If you have been detected to be hepatitis B positive and you're considering pregnancy, probably enough of you still in our setting is what you should be opting for. Ideally, one should have viral suppression before entering pregnancy. This will decrease the risk of mother-to-child transmission. 
Some women might opt for pegylate interferon, but I think in our setting, particularly in Africa, very few women will meet the appropriate clinical criteria where, hip, where interference therapy will be effective. If you become pregnant whilst on treatment, one needs to assess what is the individual on. If they're on tenofovir, this should be continued. If they're on tecovir, one should switch to tenofovir. And remembering that tenofovir has an excellent safety record in pregnancy, as been documented in HIV pregnant women, who really no increase in birth defects um, compared to the general population. So the big thing is, is mother-to-child transmission. Interuterine or transplacental transmission probably only accounts for less than 5%. And it's probably associated with a breach in the placental barrier. Hepatitis B has been demonstrated in villus capillary endothelial cells in the placental trophoblasts. And it's thought that there's mixing of maternal and fetal blood at the times of preterm labor or spontaneous abortion. And once again, as expected, high hepatitis B DNA levels are obvious risk factor. But the main problem is perinatal transmission. So the risk factors, as we know, EH and positivity, high viral loads. And it's been shown in a number of studies, women under the age of 25 are at greater risk. And this probably reflects that they are EH and positive with high viral loads and therefore much more infectious. And I think in most of our regions, we need to remember the impact of HIV. These women are more likely to be, three times more likely to test positive for DNA, have much higher DNA levels, and twice as likely to test positive for surface antigen. And a study, one of the studies from Africa has shown that the risk of mother-to-child transmission of hepatitis B is increased 2.5-fold. And once you're infected perinatally, as you know, the risk of chronicity is 90%. So why is it important? The systematic review showed that an early age of infection was associated with an increasing probability of chronic infection, but importantly, worse outcomes in terms of HCC and cirrhosis. A similar longitudinal study in the Gambia showed the mother-to-child transmission was a risk factor for persistent high viral replication, significant fibrosis, and the development of HCC. So we really need to be addressing this transmission and break these cycles of infection. So what is the risk if you're EANGEN positive? How many women in sub-Saharan Africa are positive? And this is a study looking at the prevalence. It was highest in West Africa at Nigeria by 28%, followed by Central Africa, Cameroon at 12%, lower figures from Eastern and Southern Africa, Zimbabwe by 3.3%, and South Africa by 17%. And bearing in mind that EANGEN positivity is not as high as in, in Asia, many sub-Saharan African countries because of the potential low risk of perinatal transmission from e negative women, opted to introduce the, the vaccine at 6, 10, and 14 weeks, and only 11 countries to, to date have actually implemented the birth dose vaccine. So it's important, even though the rate of transmission in sub-Saharan Africa from e positivity is low at 38%, compared to figures quoted from Asia at 70 to 90%, what we see is that, in fact, we should not be reassured by this. This is a study from 11 African countries looking at the transmission, modeling what is the prediction of prenatal acquisition of hepatitis B. And you can see there in red, it's 360,000, almost double that of HIV. So we really need to actually be addressing this problem very actively. So how can we present it? Well, we need to be screening all women for surface antigen. This should, not, this should be routine policy, as it is for HIV screening. If you're surface antigen positive, you then go on to test for the e antigen and DNA levels. And I think in our setting where, in reality, the access to HBIG is very poor, we really need to look at the role of tenofovir in the, first trimester, in the third trimester. Important to remember that the viral loads can, can rise, and so definitely one, at 26 to 28 weeks, one needs to know what that level is and to, in, to implement tenofovir. This can be continued up to 12 weeks post-delivery, but important to monitor after cessation as ALT flares can happen. The birth dose must be given within 24 hours, ideally within 12 hours. If possible, the HBIG, but I think re in reality this is not something that's an option for us. The combination of HBIG and the birth dose vaccine has decreased the risk of tremicity, perinatal transmission to less than 10%. But I think what one needs to also remember to ensure that we have the full dose of three vaccine doses following that birth dose if we're going to ensure immunity. What about other risk factors in terms of amniocentesis? Uh, the risk of transmission is low, particularly of HIV negative. Invasive monitoring of chorionic villus sampling and invasive fetal monitoring, the risk is unknown. 
There's very conflicting data in terms of preterm premature rupture of membranes, and the guidance is to manage as usual. Caesarean section is not indicated to prevent mother to child transmission, and neither is breastfeeding contraindicated, particularly when the infant has received both HBIG and the birth dose. But there is a provider remembering the risk if the, the nipples are bleeding or cracked, that remains a risk if the mother is not virally suppressed. And in those mothers who are virally suppressed on tenofovir, either for treatment or prophylaxis, they can breastfeed. Although tenofovir is excreted in the milk, the concentrations are low. And to date, we haven't seen problems documented in terms of the infant uh, poor outcomes. So moving on to hepatitis C. As we know, the global prevalence is 1%, approximately 71 million in sub-Saharan Africa being infected. And if we look at the worldwide estimation, it's estimated about 8% of pregnant women are hepatitis C infected. This was the similar review as was done for hepatitis B, looking at pregnant women in Africa. Here we looked at the prevalence here was 3.4%. And of those who were antibody positive, 62% were actually viremic. And the prevalence actually varied in, and between, between and within countries, from 0.4% in Ethiopia to 7.4% in Benin. And in Egypt, the studies varied. In 2017, a study reports 0.7%, and in a later study in 2000, of 19%. And as was expected, the prevalence also differed in different regions, the highest in North Africa at 4.6%, and the lowest in Eastern Africa at 2.1%. The study here showed that the prevalence was higher in the general population than in the general population, and this might relate to the exposure of pregnant women to unsafe medical or traditional procedures. Unlike hepatitis B, there was really no difference between rural and areas. Another interesting fact showed that the, in the study that the prevalence actually increased the decreasing portion of women, of seats held by women in parliament, showing that all of us should actually aim to, to get into these positions of power. So, who should be screened? I think there's no real policy now in terms of screening all pregnant women, but definitely, if you're at risk, you should be screened at your first prenatal visit. This should be repeated if you're negative and there's an ongoing or new risk. And if you're hepatitis C antibody negative, but there's been potential exposure within the last six months, it's ideal to do the PCR. In terms of the impact of hepatitis C, of pregnancy on hep chronic hepatitis C, as we know, there's thought to be a down-regulation of the maternal immune response during, during pregnancy. The ALT levels tend to decrease during that second and third trimester and then return to baseline after delivery. And the RNA levels may increase during that second and third trimester. And the data is really conflicting in terms of fibrosis progression during pregnancy. So in terms of post-delivery changes in chronic hepatitis C, there have been reported cases of quite significant decrease in hepatitis C viremia one to three months post-delivery. And this, this might relate to broader hepatitis C-specific T-cell gamma-producing responses, and in fact, even clearance of hepatitis C postpartum have been reported. If we look at the impact of pregnancy on acute hepatitis C, in the reported cases, the majority is, is present in the majority, but this obviously reflects diagnostic bias as pregnant women presenting with jaundice will be tested for viruses. Asymptomatic, acute hepatitis C is difficult to diagnose in pregnancy unless there's been a clear exposure risk. Immunomodulation might actually favor viral persistence, and it's unknown to date whether acute hepatitis C increases the risk of mother-to-child transmission or is associated with more adverse pregnancy outcomes. So what is the impact on chronic hepatitis C on pregnancy outcomes? What has been shown that hepatitis C pregnant women of childbearing age undergo premature ovarian senescence. So they've shown to have menopausal levels of anti-malarian hormone, which is an accurate mark of ovarian reserve, and a greater risk of mortality, of infertility, infertility with a fertility rate of 0.7% compared to 1.3% in hepatitis C negative women. They have higher rates of gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and miscarriage. And in terms of the infant, preterm labor, fetal growth restriction, low birth weights, and fewer live births occur. It's important if we actually diagnose these women early, treat them before they enter childbearing age. In fact, the adverse incomes decrease, including the risk of miscarriage. This is a very interesting um, entity, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy and the association of hepatitis C. 
the systematic review screen for hepatitis C in pregnant women presenting of ICP. And here the pooled odds ratio for ICP, if you were hepatitis C infected, was 20.4. But even more interesting, the pooled odds ratio of late hepatitis C infection amongst ICP patients was also elevated at 4. The mechanisms are unclear, but there is a potential role for bile acid transporters, either downregulation of the ABC transporter, multidrug resistant protein 2, altered regulation of the sodium torocole co transporting polypeptide. But probably the one that makes the most sense is this ABCB transporter genotype, which is associated with an increased risk, increased risk of increased bile acids. And this was found to be present in 40% of hepatitis C infected patients. And this polymorphism is also present in ICP. And this may explain the association of ICP and hepatitis C, both before and after pregnancy. So in terms of mother-child transmission, this is the commonest route of acquisition in children, the risk about 6% in mono-infected mothers, 11% if HIV and co-infected, and reported rates of 4 to 8% if individuals are on antiretroviral therapy. Higher viral loads have been shown to increase the risk, but there's no association of genotype, and there's no apparent hepatitis C cutoff to, for increased transmission risk. The vertical transfer can occur potentially during pregnancy, during delivery, or in the neonatal period. And interestingly, the transfer of hepatitis C infection to female infants may be twice as high as those to male infants. So what about other risk factors in terms of invasive prenatal diagnostic testing? There's very limited data on the impact of viral load, but amniocentesis is recommended over chorionic villus sampling. In terms of the mode of delivery, there's been shown no association between the mode of delivery and a vertical transmission of the systematic review. But importantly, this did not distinguish between elective or emergency seizures. And most studies did not assess the hepatitis C viral load at the time of delivery. In terms of labor management, there's an increased risk of transmission with internal fetal monitoring, prolonged rupture of membranes more than eight, six hours, and with an episiotomy. And caesarean is not based on viral load, is not advocated. In terms of breastfeeding, breastfeeding does not affect the risk of mother to child in mono infection, although they suggest that it might be increased in HIV co infection. And once again, one needs to be careful in the setting of cracked nipples and or bleeding nipples during breastfeeding. So no infants were actually born to hepatitis C positive mothers. It's important to screen them. They would be considered to be infected if the RNA is positive on two occasions in infants more than the age of one month of old. And if one's going to do the antibody testing, it's important to do this much later because it might reflect the mother's antibody. So we want to look at testing for that over the age of 18 months. Infected infants tend to do well. Severe hepatitis is rare. But I think importantly, the FDA has just approved soft lidiposphere in the form of oral pellets for children over the age of three for genotype one, four, five, and six. So in terms of DAAs in pregnancy, there are no published data on the safety or efficacy. Treatment is usually delayed after, to, until after delivery unless in a trial situation. But recent phase one study data suggests that there are no adverse events in women treated with soft lidiposphere in the third trimester. So importantly, one needs to identify women of childbearing age where they're infected. One needs to treat them prior to pregnancy. And importantly, always to remember to screen for other sexually transmitted um, infections. So moving on to the last virus, hepatitis E. In red, you can see where they have outbreaks occur. And if we look at the IgG prevalence in Africa, once again, this varies. Highest in North Africa at 50%, East Africa at 35%, West Africa at 16%, and Central Africa at 10%. This systematic review and meta-analysis looked at 22 studies, 12 African countries, and 8,000 pregnant women from Northwest, Central, and East Africa. And here the pooled IgG prevalence for hepatitis E amongst pregnant women was 29%. The highest seroprevalence documented in Egypt at 84%, and the lowest in Gabon at 6.6%. Prevalences also varied within countries, so studies in Egypt ranged from 45 to 84%, in Ethiopia from 31 to 58%, and from Sudan, between 12 and 61%. And the number of outbreaks have been described in Africa as listed here. In the study for this map, you can see that there's many genotype 1 and 2. And if you look at the circles, this shows the size of the epidemics, and some in some areas up to 10,000. <laughs> 
So this is the one virus really that can have severe consequences for both the mother and the child. This is a systematic review from, most of the studies were from India, and they were hospital-based, so this was sicker patients. But here the median mortality, um, maternal mortality was 26%, fetal mortality 33%, neonatal case mortality 8%, and the median prevalence of thumb and liver failure was as high as 45%. And not unexpectedly, these had the highest case fatality rates. So it's been estimated in developing countries that hepatitis E accounts for nearly 3,000 stillbirths, but probably more if one takes into account those linked to antenatal maternal deaths. In terms of those studies in the systematic review reported on preterm labor, the median prevalence was 51%, premature rupture of membranes ranged between 9 and 11%, postpartum hemorrhage between 13 and 30%, low birth weights between 57 and 86 percent, and the vertical transmission here was significant from 27 to 78 percent. And importantly, in hepatitis E, the severity increases of the gestational age is maximum in the third trimester. Maternal mortality is usually as a result of acute liver failure, or as well as a complication of hypertensive and renal complications. This small study on vertical transmission showed that the transmission was 46 percent, there's really no difference if the mothers were, had acute viral hepatitis or whether they had acute liver failure. And the only predictor here was the viral load. In fact, they estimated the cutoff at 13,000 was highly predictive of actually having vertical transmission. So in terms of prevention, unfortunately the vaccine is not commercially available outside China. To date, it hasn't been, the safety hasn't been assessed in pregnant women. There's no immunoglobulin available. Management remains supportive and ribavirin is contraindicated due to teratogenicity. A liver transplantation has been reported for mothers presenting with farm and liver failure. It's thought that breastfeeding is safe in asymptomatic women, but is advised against symptomatic women with acute hepatitis. So in conclusion, pregnancy is generally considered an immunosuppressed state. The impact of pregnancy on mothers of viral hepatitis, and importantly, the impact of viral hepatitis on the fetus or the newborn is variable depending on the type of viral hepatitis, whether it's acute or chronic. One needs to consider the risk of vertical transmission and importantly, implement appropriate preventative measures. In general, mother-to-child transmission is not increased with amniocentesis or vaginal delivery. Caesarean section is not, should not be recommended to prevent mother-to-child transmission. And breastfeeding is on the whole considered safe for chronic hepatitis B and C with the proviso that they are virally suppressed in terms of hepatitis B and they don't have and the risk of transmission of cracked and bleeding nipples. And then importantly, hepatitis A and B vaccines plus immunoglobulin are entirely safe in pregnancy and should be implemented as is appropriate. Thank you very much.